For your viewing pleasure, this broadcast of the Municipal Council Meeting of Alpena is made possible by the funding provided by the City of Alpena. Thank you for your generosity. Good evening and welcome to the Alpena City Council meeting, November 5th, 2018. Call the order, please. Huss? Here. Johnson? Here. Nielsen? Here. Nowak? Here. And Walgora? Here. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Any modifications to the agenda this evening? Approval of the minutes for open and closed sessions of October 15, 2018. Any issues or changes? Uh, citizens appearing before council on agenda and non-agenda items are allowed five minutes max to uh, address the council with your concerns. Today is, uh, this is the only time during tonight's meeting that you'll be allowed to address council. If you'd like to do so, please come to the podium and state your name and address for our records. My name is uh, Dr. Joshua Meyerson. I'm the medical director for District Health Department Number Four. My address is 710 East Lake Street, Petoskey, Michigan. So, what am I doing over here? Our, our uh, the health department here is um, uh, shared a medical director for many, many years with the health department in Northwest Michigan. So, I've been coming to Alpena for many years. Uh, this is the first time I've had the, uh, the privilege and, and to, to come to City Council. I'm really pleased that I could be here tonight and that you were. Uh, welcome to have me. I'm here to talk about uh, tobacco and promoting uh, tobacco-free parks and beaches. I know I've read in the paper and I became aware of that. Um, and um, I have uh, and I've presented to you today a letter uh, giving the health department's full support um, for your initiative to look at banning tobacco use in all of your parks and beaches. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful um, idea. I'm looking at, at uh, you know, the, the thing that right behind you, bold steps. Um, it is a bold step, but it, it's the kind of thing we need to further combat uh, what is, you know, still, you know, we, we don't think about it, but it's still the number one cause of preventable morbidity and mortality of disease and death in this country, in this state, and in, and in, and in Alpena is smoking. So there's nothing you can do more to promote health uh, than try to reduce smoking rates in your community. Um, about 20% of adults in Michigan smoke in Alpena is probably around the same. Uh, the last statistics I have for Alpena is about 19%. Um, so that's good, it's gone down um, over, over the years, but about 10% of teens still smoke, and what's more worrisome is about 15% of the last data I have used uh, electronic cigarettes or vaping and those rates are actually, it's becoming epidemic if you talk, I don't know if there's any teachers here, but if you talk to teachers, um, it's everywhere in the schools. Um, uh, the, the cat's just out of the bag, and that's sad because, um, you know, it, it leads to nicotine addiction, you know, it's a lifetime thing for anyone who smokes or used to smoke, you know, it's a difficult, difficult thing um, to, to try to stop doing, um, and it's a lifetime of addiction, which just leads to health problems down the line. Um, so, um, you know, every year in this state, um, we, we have 16,000 people in our state die from tobacco use. Um, and then uh, about 10,000 children replace them by becoming new regular daily smokers. And a third of those children are going to die early because of their tobacco use. So it's still a big problem for us, um, and promoting smoke and tobacco-free environments promotes the public health by discouraging the use by individuals, 
a big part of it is by reducing that social acceptability. You're, you're decreasing the, you're denormalizing tobacco use. We used to smoke everywhere in our planes, in our cars, in our doctor's offices, you know, and, and we've look, come a long way. We need to continue that denormalization and decreasing the social acceptability of it. Um, but it's also because 80% of us don't smoke and we have a right to breathe clean air. And I know you think, well, it's a park, it's a beach. But um, I think we've all known, we've all been, uh, I've been to beaches and you plop down and someone next to you is smoking. And I respect their right, you know, it's a legal thing to do. I respect the right to smoke, but if you're downwind from them, you know, you're not breathing, you're breathing dangerous air. And it's been well documented that outdoor air levels in parks and beaches can reach um, just as bad air levels as someone smoking indoors if you have the right kind of wind conditions and everything else. So it's important to protect them and, and uh, promote healthy spaces. Um, another thing I think, as you all know, it creates a lot of litter. Um, vaping cartridges get left behind. Those can be dangerous, so it's not just tobacco butts, but it can be all sorts of other um, tobacco use. When, when you hear tobacco control people or doctors or public health people say tobacco-free environments, we're talking about cigarettes, vaping, um, cigars, any sort of tobacco or nicotine containing product. And I encourage you to have uh, an ordinance or a regulation or a or a resolution that, that bans all products because it's just a lot simpler that way. Um, so really, you know, again, just most of us want to enjoy public free, uh, tobacco free parks and beaches. Um, research evidence shows that they're effective at reducing exposure to secondhand smoke, but also at reducing tobacco use among children. Um, I know uh, in the northwest part, and I, I passed out that map to you guys, there's a lot of different small communities, cities, churches <coughs> that have, um, and they've all done different things. Some have done, uh, you know, are, are more stringent than others, but they have done a lot to ban um, smoking in, in public parks and, and in beaches. And really, I think you can talk to them. <coughs> if you have good signage, they're self they're pretty much self-enforcing. Enforcement is not a big issue. People, especially in Northern Ireland, people usually follow the law. Not always, but people are generally respectful if they know that they're not allowed to smoke there, they'll, they'll go elsewhere. So um, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate you having me here. I, you have my uh, phone number and my email. I'm glad to answer any questions. I also would love to show, you know, the health department is a resource for you. I mean, I'm sure you're not surprised that the health department is, is all for tobacco control, but um, we're here as a resource. If you need further information, don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Hello. I'm Kathy Goyke, 539 Plymouth Drive, Alpena. And um, not only with the health aspects of uh, tobacco, but I really want to commend your initiation of the discussion of banning tobacco in our public places and beaches. As a resident, um, it is very disheartening to go to these places and ha see the litter. And um, I had children, we've grown up here, I have animals that um, have to put the butts in their mouth and eaten them. And so um, I want to look at the environmental issue too, not only just the health issue. And I had three sons with Alpena Public Schools that have all came and cleaned up beaches through classes and that. And they still talk about how gross it was um, picking up the cigarette butts, which was mostly the litter. So, um, you know, even those butts, when they're out, the minute water touches them, they start seeping toxic chemicals into the ground. It's affecting our wildlife, not only our humans, but, you know, the natural uh, habitat and wildlife. So I would really like to, um, for you to consider that to ban on tobacco. And um, the vaping, the cartridges, um, we're seeing them all over. And so it's not just the cigarette butts anymore, but it's the e-cigarettes. and the, So as a resident, I commend you, and I'd like you to further discuss that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kathy. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, tonight's consent agenda, A, are bills to be allowed in the amount of $321,913.99. B, is a budget amendment request to transfer $1,245 from the general fund to the police fund. 
C is mayoral reappointments of Paul Sabrin, Gretchen Kirshner, and Steve Gilmore to the Planning Commission for a three-year term expiring 11-1-21. I move we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Yes. Yes. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. <coughs> Nowak? Yes. And we'll go up. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, next up, presentations. The Congressional Fire Service Institute's Award, Excellent in Fire-Based EMS. Uh, Chief Forbush is coming up. Good evening. I'm going to be a long part of the presentation tonight, sorry. Uh, in April, we were honored to be selected as the 2018 recipient, one of two of the Congressional Fire Service Institute's Excellence in Fire-Based EMS Award. The initial presentation was made before a crowd of 1,500 fire service leaders and congressional leaders in Washington, D.C. Our success, however, is through the support of the Alpena City Council, the County Board of Commissioners, and the first responders throughout Alpena County. Uh, I'd like to uh, recognize some of the county commissioners, commissioners that are here with us tonight. We have Commissioner Brad McRoberts in the back, and <coughs> Commissioner Ron McDonald, and our own Deputy Fire Chief and Commissioner Bob Adrian. CFSI Director, Executive Director Bill Webb flew into Alpena County Regional Airport this afternoon just to be with us here tonight. He is joined by David Gelfund, representing Massimo Corporation, the medical equipment manufacturer that generously sponsors the award. Gentlemen. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, uh, Mayor Wallagor uh, and members of the City Council. Thank you for allowing the Congressional Fire Services Institute in Massimo this opportunity to address you this evening. We are here once again to recognize the Alpena Fire Department for receiving the CFSI Massimo Excellence in Fire Service Based EMS Award, a national award that recognizes fire departments for innovations in the delivery of emergency medical services. Fire departments across our nation are called upon over 30 million times a year to respond to emergencies. They respond at any time during the day or night, in any weather conditions, and to any situation. They are our first responders, our domestic defenders. On April 19th of this year, as the Chief said, approximately 1,500 fire service leaders uh, attended the, uh, the 30th Annual National Fire and Emergency Services Dinner in Washington, D.C. The event is hosted by my organization, the Congressional Fire Services Institute. The event pays tribute to the men and women of our nation's fire and emergency services who respond every day to those emergency medical calls. During the dinner program, CFSI presented awards to both individuals and organizations for outstanding leadership. With the support of Massimo, we presented the CFSI Massimo Excellence in Fire Service based EMS award to two departments for leadership and innovations in the delivery of emergency medical services. We all understand the increasing challenges fire departments are facing in delivering EMS care. Despite these challenges, we know that there are many fire departments doing innovative things to enhance their EMS capabilities. This award pays tribute to those departments that look at challenges as opportunities, opportunities to make changes to better serve communities with the highest quality emergency medical care. We honored your department, as you may know by now, for its innovations in cardiac care treatment. Your mobile intensive care unit and high-performance CPR training program are making a positive difference for the citizens served by your fire department. The same can be said of the creation of your AED registry and the placement of AEDs throughout your jurisdiction. Under the leadership of Chief Forbush, the fire department recognized the need to, prove, to improve cardiac arrest survival rates in non-arrest cardiac pre-hospital care and implemented new programs that are making a positive difference. Now the primary reason for tonight, uh, tonight's event is to recognize the entire network of stakeholders for their contributions to this effort. First and foremost, the, El City, uh, excuse me, the Alpena City Council and the Alpena uh, County Board of Commissioners. CFSI and Massimo recognize that a fire department requires the full support of local government and of citizens to launch new programs, programs that often need additional resources. On behalf of CFSI and Massimo, I'd like to thank each one of you for providing that support. We are sharing Alpena's innovations with other fire departments across the nation that are seeking ideas to address similar challenges in cardiac care treatment. 
That is the value in conducting this award program, to share innovative practices so that fire departments across the nation can continue providing the best level of care to the people they serve. It is important to note that our two organizations alone did not select your fire department for this award. The selection committee was comprised of representatives from the International Association of Fire Chiefs, the International Association of Firefighters, the National Fire Protection Association, and the National Volunteer Fire Council, in addition to our two organizations. So on behalf of CFSI and Massimo, it is our pleasure to be here today, tonight, to present this award. I, uh, David Gelfand with Massimo, the uh, mid mid long day today, <laughs> Midwest Regional Manager, is here to participate in this uh, award presentation. And what we'd like to do is present the award to you, Mr. Mayor, and to present the award to uh, the County Commissioner, Mr. Roberts. Uh, so if we can have you two come up here, we'd like to do a little award presentation, Mr. Roberts. Massimo is proud and honored to be a sponsor of this award, and congratulations to Bill and the Alpena Fire Department. On behalf of the two companies, we present you with the. deal of the credit this evening goes to our incredible firefighter paramedics. Our 30 cross trained firefighter paramedics and command staff provide exceptional care to the citizens of Alpena and Alpena County. A subgroup of specially trained critical care paramedics care for critically ill or injured patients being transferred via our mobile intensive care unit to larger medical centers for definitive care. Two of our guys right now are in Pittsburgh starting their two week critical care training to add to the staff. We depend on our 911 dispatchers and trained first responders in each community to initiate basic life support care prior to our arrival and to work with us on scene to enhance the care that we provide. The citizens of Alpena County pay a small millage to provide 24-7 advanced life support ambulance response countywide. We provide that service exclusively, but we count on others to help the EMS system work. Like our medical directors, Dr. Chris Rancott and now Dr. Paul Bookie, I'd like to present certificates of appreciation to each of our first responder agencies that were able to make it tonight to share our CFSI success with them as well. It only works if we all work together. If Mayor Walladora and Commissioner McRoberts could please join me, just a few more certificates. <coughs> Alpena County Central Dispatch whose emergency medical dispatchers tirelessly work 24-7 to collect information, interrogate callers, get the uh, prioritized response information, and then uh, send the appropriate response. Our director, Bert Francisco, represents them, and we'd like to present just this, this uh, certificate of appreciation to share in our CFSI success with your people. Thank you, sir. Long Rapids Township Fire Department. Chief Neil MacArthur is here. Long Rapids is one of the uh, stations for our ECHO unit. It's stationed three days a week at Long Rapids and two days at Wilson, about 20 miles west of town to reduce ALS response times and augment first responder coverage. Chief MacArthur, thank you very much, and we want to share our success with you as well. Thank you, sir. 
Wilson Township Fire Department. <coughs> We're very, uh, very proud of our Wilson Township Supervisor, who happens to be a city paramedic firefighter as well. Dan Hibner, thank you very much for your help, sir. And just slightly over the border, the Preskill Township Fire Department is also served by our agency. Our fire board chair, Dick Nowak, is here, if he'd come up. For 30 years or so, we've served the east or the west side of Preskill Township, and we support the East Grand Lake Department on the other side of the intercepts. They have a basic ambulance. Uh, so we're proud to work with them as well. Dick? Thank you. Thank you very much. And if all of you could just stay for a moment, that would be a good picture. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you very much. That concludes our program this evening. Uh, our folks are going to go downstairs for a minute and do pictures and all that stuff. Bob's going to stay here for our council coverage. And uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I'm sure this top down should be a nice company. Okay. Well, let's see how I can ice it up. All right, next up, report of officers, uh, health insurance 2019, opt out of PA 152. Okay, I was asked to see if I could talk previous, so the best way is we've opted. This is a request to opt out, but we're opt out in insurance totally. Everybody's on their own. <laughs> <laughs> That'll lock that off. I can see the employees are very pleased about that. Yeah. Uh, actually, now for the last six years, so this will be number seven, uh, the city had, or the staff has requested council to opt out of PA 152, which basically gives you a couple of options in regard to uh, dealing with uh, health insurance and costs uh, as they relate to the employee and the employer. Uh, it is either that we do what is considered the uh, hard cap where they state what the number is. Uh, the state does each year that's adjusted is how much uh, the municipality can pay towards uh, premiums. And the other is uh, an 80-20, which is what we have chosen to do and uh, did as a phase in over four years, a uh, number of years ago. Uh, and that has worked well. Uh, but in the last uh, couple of years, we have gone to the uh, use of high deductible uh, health savings account uh, plans. And with those, we have found that we have had savings in terms of overall costs for the city, yet under the statute, we exceed the 20 or the 80 20 split. We end up uh, actually doing more than 80%. And that is because we, the premiums are divided and co-shared 80-20, but then the city does contribute to employees' HSA accounts or FSA, which are flexible savings accounts, if they are not in an HSA plan. Um, so we've always been above, but we've saved money in doing so. Uh, we get our renewals each year. We got them this September. And for our two high deductible HSA plans, we had good news that uh, each one of them was less than a 5% increase in premiums. However, we had two Simply Blue, which are your typical, you know, somewhat typical PPO uh, plans, which are closer to traditional insurance, and they went up 28 to 30% each. And uh, it was determined that that was simply an unsustainable amount. So we've eliminated those plans and went with one that is kind of a hybrid. It's an HMO, but it contains some of the characteristics still of a PPL, but as a result of that, it's not eligible for an HSA account, but it can be an FSA. But still, with those changes, we're still over the 80-20 that's allowed by the law. So with that, what we are, as staff, I am asking the council to do is to once again, for the uh, calendar year of 2019, 
that the city opt out of the uh, requirements of PA 152 in regard to the 80-20 uh, cost share for all uh, medical costs, uh, insurance costs that we would have. I have no questions. Mm -hmm. We've done this several times. Yes, yeah. every year. <laughs> and again, uh, unless we get to a point where we fall below, we'll still have to approve annually the 80-20, but we wouldn't opt out. Sure. Right I move we opt out of PA 152. For 2019. For 2019, mm -hmm. thank you. Second. Johnson? Yes. Nielsen? Yes. Nowak? Yes. Walgora? Aye. And Hess? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. uh, unfinished business, medical and recreational marijuana update. <coughs> and Paul? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we heard Dr. Meyerson talk about uh, tobacco. I'll talk about that again. We'll talk about marijuana. Um, just for an update, um, on October 11, the Medical Marijuana Committee met and discussed medical marijuana and the recreational marijuana uh, proposal one, which is on the ballot. Uh, additionally, staff attended the Michigan Municipal League workshop on the subject on October 23rd, where the director of the State Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation and a municipal attorney addressed both medical and recreational marijuana. The committee wanted to provide city council with an update of the progress of medical marijuana and that has, they have made and some of the specifics regarding the proposal one recreational marijuana. So as far as the medical marijuana, um, I'm gonna, I can keep this to one paragraph. Uh, December of 2017 marked the date when it became legal to open medical marijuana facilities in the state of Michigan. The state's licensing and regulatory affairs division, uh, LARA, took, took the task of creating a regulatory framework and started processing applications utilizing temporary rules that would be replaced with permanent rules effective June of 2018, or so they said. Uh, LARA created a separate division within their agency um, called the Bureau of Medical Marijuana Regulation or the acronym is BUMMER, kind of appropriate, um, <laughs> who began process, I can't make this up, but, who began processing the applications. Over 700 applications have been received for facilities in Michigan, I think it was actually 780. Uh, October 25th marked the, I'm sorry, and only 50 have been approved in the 10 months since they began taking applications. October 25th marked the first medical marijuana that was sold using the BUMMER approved regulations, which include seed to sale tracking. Permanent rules have still not been implemented, and Bummer noted that uh, they were hoping to have permanent rules in place by late November. At the moment, communities who opt in for these facilities will, uh, will receive 25% of the 3% excise tax. If Proposal 1 passes, that tax, is, that tax is no longer present. On October 30th, courts ruled that, um, so just a few days ago, courts ruled that the medical marijuana program was not being rolled out fast enough to justify shutting down unlicensed medical marijuana um, commercial facilities or the, uh, the, the legal shops that had been operating, and that um, they were scheduled to be closed on the 31st, and they would not allow the state to set a shutdown date for those shops at this time. So that's where we're at with medical marijuana. Um, so they're, it's moving, but it's moving slowly. Um, and I'll take questions, whatever you want to throw at me, but I'll go right into recreation. I'll try to paraphrase this a little because there's a lot here. But as far as on the ballot for tomorrow, um, this proposal one, it allows for recreational marijuana use. Um, part of this proposal allows for communities to regulate commercial facilities based on, loca based on location um, if they choose. If the local government would prefer these activities not be allowed at all, the government unit must pass an ordinance or a resolution to opt out from the commercial and industrial facilities. Again, that's different from medical because we didn't have to do anything for that. We just needed to not take action. This one, we have to take action if we choose to, if we choose to opt out. The community could later choose to opt back in at any time. Um, it should be noted that much of the original medical marijuana law in 2000, much like the original medical marijuana law in 2008, Proposal 1 is voter initiated. The Medical Marijuana Facilities Licensing, Licensing Act, and then FLA, came out of the legislature. Because of this, proposal, one, proposal One's language does not match the existing MMFLA, which would appear to leave elements of the proposal right to be determined within the courts. For instance, there is a section that states that communities can regulate commercial facilities but cannot place unreasonably impractical restrictions on these facilities. They attempt to define that term in the definition section, but the courts are going to have to determine what exactly unreasonably and impractical is. Uh, more than, you know, almost certainly. Uh, the, the problem is, 
Okay, in addition, the proposal states that facilities will not be allowed in exclusively residential zones. Uh, the problem is that our community and most others in the state and nation allow churches, schools, and limited, and also limited commercial, uh, like corner stores, um, which are non-residential uses located in residential zones. This creates a potential loophole within the law if passed, as none of our residentially, no, residential zones or areas would be considered exclusive to residential use. In addition, many other parts of the proposal do not line up with the MMFLA, which results in regulatory issues. For instance, commercial growers can grow under the MMFLA, can grow 500,000 or 1,500 plants. Under Proposal 1, those numbers are 100, 500, to 2,000 plants. In addition, Proposal 1, 1 allows cities to set the limits on the total number of facilities they allow, um, but, does not, but does not, that does not include the type of facility meaning that all types could be constructed unlike the MMFLA, which allows municipality to choose uh, to limit the types of facilities uh, and the number. Um, if a municipality sets limits on the number, they must select using a, um, from competing applications using a competitive process, and that's the term they use, and select applicants who are the best suited to operate a facility. To date, most municipalities have uh, utilize either a lottery system or a first come first serve, first serve system to avoid the lawsuits that often, often competi the competitive process brings. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this um, the tax side of it, but just know that the medical marijuana committee or the marijuana committee, I guess now, has previously recommended that if the city decides to opt in for either medical or recreational marijuana, money from the proposed tax should probably should not be a motivating factor. Um, as far as timelines, I'll skip down to that. Proposal, if Proposal 1 passes, local units of government will have at least 12 months before Lara starts issuing recreational facility licenses. Hopefully many of the questions inherent to this proposal will be addressed prior to that time. If the city would prefer to opt out of recreational marijuana, it is recommended the opt out be done via an ordinance and not a resolution. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions. I don't have any until Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll do a lot more after tomorrow. Obviously. I did include a map showing where all the residential zones and schools are located. I did not include ACC on this map because they specifically talk about K through 12 schools. And although I think some high schools do attend ACC, so that's a gray area. But nevertheless, of the areas that are not under any color would be potential potential locations for facilities. If we don't set any additional zoning restrictions, and again, that's unclear whether we can can or not at this point. And just to throw, uh, add that in my report to council, and I had done this previously regarding uh, Grand Haven uh, initiative to have uh, their legal counsel, which is a firm, to uh, draft documents in the event this does pass uh, to. If you're going to allow these facilities, then what kind of ordinances, regulations should you have? But also, if you want to opt out, they're going to draft that kind of language as well. Uh, they then went across the state asking other communities that they wanted to join in, rather than everybody trying to write their own set of ordinances and regulations, of to set a template that everybody could then use, modify, whatever. Uh, and it's a large number, a very large number of communities have said they would like to join in. Um, the cost now is, is $700. Uh, Adam and I talked and we thought that made sense, uh, was cost effective, rather than asking Bill to try to draft all these things on his own, what you would need to do is we could get these templates, then that, sit down with Bill and work out depending upon which way we're gonna go. Because we will, if it passes, we have to to act one way or the other, either opt out or we got to have ordinances in place. Otherwise, there could be some unintended, undesirable consequences come a year from from uh, that time of when the ordinance or law goes into effect. Um, I'm waiting as well. Uh, the check's actually been cut, uh, and I have to sign a letter of engagement. But I'm just going to wait until I find out that the results of the uh, election. Uh, if it doesn't pass, I don't see the need for us to do it at this time. There will be other opportunities in the future if this comes back. If it passes, then I think it's $700 well invested. Mario. 
and their legal team was chosen because they have experience. Well, they've worked with the city. They're, they're attorneys, but they've also worked with them on these things in terms of with some of this. So, um, I mean, it doesn't mean that we can't take what they do and, you know, tweak and right? Because every community is going to sure be different is. and that will happen, but it's not having to go in and start from scratch and try to come up with these things. Okay. So. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And, and your committee. You want to, do we need to, you want to receive and file his report or just a, that's just an update? Not really a, okay. Um, okay. Just an update. Okay. Okay. I move we adjourn to closed session to discuss water and sewer litigation. Second. Nielsen? Yes. You know what? Yes. Balgora? Aye. Hess? Yes. And Johnson? Yes. Motion carried.